And it's time for Politics Monday. I'm back with our regular team, Amy Walter of the Cook Political Report and the host of Politics with Amy Walter on WNYC Radio. And Tamara Keith of NPR. She also co-hosts the NPR Politics Podcast. Hello to both of you. Politics Monday. So let's talk about Joe Biden, first of all, Tam. Um, and that is his apology, as we reported, some days after he made the reference and then in the debate he was confronted by Kamala Harris. Is it working? Is it going to work for him at this stage to say, I made a mistake? He has dominated the news cycle of the Democratic primary for three weeks. Uh, and not necessarily in the way you want to dominate the news cycle. Uh, because, as you say, first it was his comments about the segregationists. Uh, now, he said that, you know, he, he found them despicable, but that he could work with them. Um, but then the debate and then the aftermath of the debate. So uh, with this speech, he wasn't just apologizing. He was also trying to get out ahead of something where he's been behind for weeks. Um, and he was trying to paint a broader picture about his record related to criminal justice and other issues of race, um, trying to get ahead of it. It's not clear yet whether it will work. Uh, clearly, his opponents in the Democratic race um, see an opportunity, uh, and they are taking it. Does it look right. like a successful strategy to you? Well, I agree with Tam that when, you know, the classic line in politics is when you're explaining, you're losing, right? And so he's spent a lot of time explaining, and that's really been the question about Joe Biden from the very beginning, which is how much explaining for his 40-year record is he going to have to do during this campaign? Can he make one sort of blanket statement and move on? And he tried to do that a little bit in that South Carolina speech, which is to say, look, when I came to the Senate, I was 29 years old. A lot has changed in this country over those last many years. A lot has changed within the Democratic Party. I've changed, too. Um, he said, I've witnessed incredible change, and I've changed also. I've grown, and that's a good thing. But the challenge was not so much that his voting record, it was how he characterized working with segregationists. And also, his theory of the case in this race is a is, is difficult, right? What he's counting on is that there is a bigger constituency in the Democratic Party for somebody who's willing to work across the aisle, for somebody who's willing to be a compromiser, so for somebody who's willing to sort of stick within the system rather than trying to blow up the system. And African American voters are a key, key element yes. to his success. It's why he's the front runner right now, but we're starting to see that vote splinter away. And that's what I want to ask you all about, because as we just showed, uh, and as we just heard in Yamisha's report, Tam, uh, you had a parade of a number of candidates talking about uh, home, home ownership, talking about ways to redress economic disparity in the African-American community. Is that the way they win over voters, by talking about these substantive issues? It's certainly one way, but the other thing that African-American voters and all voters in the Democratic primary continue to be looking for is, who's the one who can win? Who's the one who can beat President Trump? And that has been such a, a critical part of Joe Biden's case, um, where even in the debate, he was, the, all of the candidates were asked, what's the first thing you'll do as president? And he says, beat Donald Trump. Um, and so uh, part of what has happened with this three weeks is that the idea of, of Biden as the most electable candidate is starting to erode. And if you go back to 2008, uh, Hillary Clinton had the African-American vote right. until she didn't, until it became, became clear to those voters that Barack Obama, now President Obama, uh, former President Obama, could be the one who could, who could go all the way. Yeah. And I, I agree with that. And I also think, you know, the challenge right now, if you're Joe Biden, in terms of holding on to those mm. voters, policy becomes important. And I think I remember right after a conference that was held for African American women, talking to people who hosted that conference, folks who were in the audience that said, part of the reason that Elizabeth Warren did so well with this audience is because she was so well versed mm. on the policy and the issues. But yes, Beating Donald Trump, number one, but also being in touch with and seeming 
um, well prepared for questions about the lives and the concerns of a very, very important constituency. Which and, and, and Elizabeth Warren was, as we as we see, going into a lot of detail. That's right. On, on these things that's this right. weekend. The other thing that's going on among Democrats, or you should say, between Speaker <laughs> Nancy Pelosi and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Uh, uh, Tam is is I don't know what you call it. It's not a feud, but it is certainly uh, uh, shall we say an expression of different <laughs> views yeah. on uh, what the Democratic Party stands for. Yeah. And you have the uh, Nancy Pelosi gave an interview to Maureen Dowd of the New York Times, in which among other things she was somewhat dismissive of the younger and more progressive liberal members of her caucus. Um, is this a is this a split? that we should take seriously? Is it just a momentary uh, disagreement, blip? How, do, how, do, how should we see this? Well, there is an expression about herding cats, uh, and, and Democrats uh, are often like herding cats. They have a lot of different views. Uh, and Nancy Pelosi, as the speaker, has had this role where she has uh, tried to herd the cats. Um, and, and one of the challenges here is that Pelosi is thinking about the entire Democratic uh, caucus, conference in the House. Um, she's thinking about all those people who were just elected in 2018 in districts that were held by Republicans before. And then the, the more progressive Democrats who are frustrated with this, um, they were elected in really safe Democratic seats. They have different, they have different equities. They have different things that they're worried about. Yeah, the, the majorities are built on moderates and swing seats. And Republicans lost control last year by losing those swing districts. Democrats lost control in 2010 by losing those swing districts. It's also the reality now that we, you know, as we're watching America and voters become more partisan and more polarized, it's happening in Congress too. There, there used to be a time when, for both parties, there would be folks within their party that represented districts that were very different from the majority of people in that conference, but they all found a way to get along, and they were even willing to work with the other party to pass legislation. Do we that remember that. Do, I, I am old enough to even remember and those remember days, that. but that doesn't happen anymore. And so uh, the challenge, um, I think, that Pelosi and Biden, they're both in this category of the system can only work if we compromise. The system can only work if we stay closer to the middle. That does. That sounds really out of touch to a generation that grew up seeing only division. And if you grew up only watching President Obama, who said, I can do this, I can heal the wounds, I can bring the country together, bring the fever down, well, that didn't work very well. And it's certainly not working for Donald Trump either. And it's the generation that says, we've got the energy and That's we've right. got the firepower and we're the ones who are going to turn people out to That's vote. Right. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Amy Walter, Tamara Keith, thank you both. You're, You're welcome. welcome.